Ladies and gentlemen, the internet, beginning in the early 1960s and developing over a course of three decades, was officially commercialized in 1995. With the internet came the World Wide Web. The implications of these developments have had a tremendous impact on almost every aspect of our lives. The authors of the Constitution could not have predicted such a monumental change in the way the world communicates, conducts business, and accesses information. Recent attempts to pass legislation regarding the Internet have been difficult and controversial. The Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, known as CISPA, which passed in the U.S. House and awaits the vote of the Senate, is one example. The Obama administration has threatened to veto CISPA. This past January, widespread internet blackout protests show the overwhelming disapproval of a similar law, known as SOPA. The topic of how or whether to regulate the internet remains complex and unanswered. Our speakers will discuss a range of constitutional issues related to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, the Copyright Clause, the First and Fourth Amendments, and Internet Piracy. Out of respect for our speakers, we ask that you please silence your cell phones and remain courteous throughout the program. Mr. Avsak, the floor is yours. You will have 10 minutes, and so will Professor Koo. Okay. Uh, pleasure to be here. Really, really a pleasure to be here, part of these uh, ceremonies and festivities. And I've asked Professor Koo to go gentle on me. I have a feeling that Professor Koo has a lot more experience at discussing these matters than I do. But uh, I do have some experience, some practical experience in my previous life. Before I became a lawyer, I was a professional musician. I wrote a lot of songs. I actually made my living uh, on copyrights, solely on copyrights, both public performance of my copyrights and mechanical licenses for selling records. Um, so I have a certain perspective. When I went to law school, uh, which was later in life, uh, although I can't believe I've been a lawyer for 17 years, um, I had a certain view of fair use, a certain view of the Copyright Act, and I gotta tell you, my views have really evolved over time, uh, and I have a much more expansive view of fair use than I did when, uh, actually when I was in law school, the very famous Two Live Crew case came down. Uh, I won't talk about that right now, but some of you are probably familiar with it. Um, so let me address some of the questions here so I don't waste time. This is about um, internet piracy. So what does it mean to talk about internet piracy? Well, at its simplest level, artists work to make a living, and um, writers work hard to write books, and law school professors write treatises, and uh, Ellen correctly cited se uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, which is the intellectual property clause uh, in the Constitution, which is there to really incent authors and inventors um, to create works and to contribute them to our culture so that we have a much richer culture. That really is the purpose of uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. Again, when I went to law school, I had a different view, I thought, you know, I was entitled to what I created as maybe a natural right or some sort of quid pro quo. Uh, but I have come to uh, support the correct position, which is that this monopoly, which was in the Constitution, and which has been expanded over the years, uh, till right now it's life of the author plus seven years, um, is, is a monopoly. And monopolies are inherently bad. For society, we don't, you know, we don't, we don't like monopolies, but we feel uh, the framers of the Constitution and Congress, as it's elongated the Act uh, or the time of protection, uh, believe that it was a necessary evil to incent authors to create and inventors to invent all sorts of great things, so we had a great culture. Give them a monopoly for a limited time, so that they could reap the benefits of their creations and license them and make money from them, and then at some point they would be thrust into the public domain. And we had different schemes for how that was done over time. Personally, I feel the Copyright Act is too long right now, 
at life plus 70 years. I don't think uh, that is necessary to incent authors. I don't think there's any author out there who goes, hmm, life plus 70 versus life plus 50. You know, life plus 50 doesn't exactly do it for me. I'll, the extra 20 years now will create something. And besides which, this theory can even be a sale of, on the grounds that, you know, a lot of times authors and musicians and inventors don't need the promise of a monopoly in order to create things. I mean, men write songs to woo women, write poetry to woo women, people want to be famous. Uh, there are certain inventors who just want to do good for society, and I don't know that anyone would hold back a cure for cancer just because of the monopoly, the promise of a monopoly. But let me say this. I think there is an inherent fairness in the monopoly. I mean, after all, uh, artists need to make money and, and make a living, and what is wrong with giving them, for some limited time, uh, this monopoly, which they can make money by exploiting their work. So, <clears throat> I think most people would agree that on the internet, which has suddenly changed the game, it has democratized distribution. Right? Because it used to be in the 70s and the 80s, if you were a musician, for example, or you were an author of books, you had to kowtow to big media to be able to put your work out. And they controlled all the distribution. Okay? And what the internet did, and it's a wonderful thing, it democratized distribution. So now anybody, any band, a lot of your friends can just put out a work. Um, and, you know, they can, they can just do that. The problem is, of course, on the internet, uh, everybody's got, uh, you know, a, a website, so how do, you, how do you cut through? But most people would agree that the wholesale copying of someone else's work without compensation is probably, probably wrong and problematic. There's a different kind of piracy, though, that maybe is more mixed, which is, you know, using copyrighted works to create other works um, where we now have a read-write culture, again, where the consumer, where people have found their voice and are using works to mash them up to do very creative things that is probably harming no one, but because of the scheme of our Copyright Act, the infringe copyrights. And we can talk about whether or not that's uh, piracy. Now, I'm going to run out of time, so let me just cut to the chase here. So, uh, what has happened is, um, has this affected the music industry, the internet, and piracy? Absolutely. I mean, business is way down. When I go to record companies now in New York, there's all kinds of empty cubicles because business is way down, and internet piracy continues to affect the music industry, for example, at about 28 30% per year. There have been efforts to combat it. Uh, a lot of these are voluntarily working with intermediaries such as Google and credit card companies and advertisers trying to get buy-in and cooperation to cooperate so that a site like LimeWire doesn't see the light of day. And when LimeWire was shut down, make no mistake, there was a huge impact on piracy. And it was a good thing. Um, now, where we get into trouble, and I'll just go on the record saying this, that when we get into SOPA, the Pipe of the Stop Online Piracy Act, the Protect IP Act, where we try to legislate those things, you know, the cooperation between the inter among the intermediaries, that is where we get into all sorts of problematic things with respect to the Constitution, like prior restraints on free speech. And all this matters very much because the internet was designed as a very open architecture, free. And when you start putting all sorts of shackles on the internet, you really start um, you really start screwing around with that open architecture, and it affects you know free speech and free intercourse. And um, I'm, I'm going to run out of time, so before I get into those mechanisms, I, I probably uh, should stop right now. But that sort of sets the scene. And so our main uh, statute right now is still the Copyright Act, and it's very powerful. And it's counterbalanced by the fair use doctrine. Um, and here's my opening statement, Professor Koo. 
like Mark, I'd like to thank everyone for inviting me here, and it's a great pleasure to participate in this. Uh, and very much enjoy it. all the time I've spent with Mark. He's a great asset to, to case our community. And uh, as his talk demonstrated, it's going to be a little difficult for us to kind of find room for debate, as he's an incredibly reasonable person, and I'd like to think I'm an incredibly reasonable person uh, on these issues. But given that it's supposed to be a debate, I'll, I'll try to find some uh, areas of disagreement that can make this a little more contentious. Uh, I wanted to go to the, he asked us to address a couple of questions before uh, kind of get delving into the details of our talk. And one of them was, what does it really mean to talk about internet piracy? Uh, I just wanted to give you kind of the standard uh, copyright industry's approach to what is internet piracy. And one of the arguments is anything that you're doing online that involves an unauthorized copy, uh, whether you're simply viewing it, or let alone distributing it, or making it available to other people, is internet piracy. Uh, and some of the estimates that like to be thrown around, and I emphasize estimates because it's very difficult to actually quantify uh, these things, is that internet piracy in 2010, for example, uh, cost the music industry $12.5 billion. Okay. What does that equate to? Uh, it essentially equates, in their estimation, to 71,000 jobs lost, uh, or a loss in $2.7 billion in workers' earnings uh, lost as a result of online piracy. Uh, and one other statistic would be that essentially 42% of all software run on computers throughout the world is illegally downloaded off the internet, which in 2010, the estimate was cost the industry $59 billion uh, a year. Right? So clearly from an industry perspective, right, th this is an incredibly big deal. I mean, we're talking about billions uh, of dollars of potentially lost revenue. And again, potentially, because a lot of the studies that have been done on this, in particular when studies have been done on file sharing, have questioned whether or not all those downloads would actually turn into purchases uh, if the choice was, well, I'd actually have to buy this or I'd get it, to free and just get it for free and just try it out. And in fact, the substitution rate uh, was quite, uh, quite small. Right? So essentially, I think one of the estimates was for every 12 downloads, uh, you, you lost one potential sale, right? which means most people are downloading something to try it out rather than uh, to replace a legitimate purchase. Uh, as Mark pointed out, uh, there are different systems that seem to be dif uh, differently problematic. Uh, LimeWire Lime Wire was one of them. Uh, and when LimeWire was shut down, the music industry actually saw quite a dramatic jump, for example, in, in actual purchases. Uh, now, many of you might not guess, what's the major content industry that's actually distributed in, in terms of unauthorized copies online? Uh, those of you who are Avenue Q fans might have some inkling uh, as to this. Uh, so if we shut down internet piracy today, what in content industry in the United States would benefit the most in terms of reducing online copies? Anyone? Yeah? The NDAA? No. Uh, the, the Motion Picture Association would be second, right, but not first. Anyone? The pornography industry, right? So I met that much in Avenue Q, right? There's a fantastic song that's essentially that said, Ethernet is for porn. Right? And uh, in 2010, uh, the estimates are that pornography accounted for 35.8% of unauthorized use online and sharing online. The movie industry second at 35.2%. Uh, TV shows next at 14.5%. Uh, and games, software, then both account for about 6.7% each. Uh, and lastly, the music industry at 2.9%. That's actually one of the smallest uh, uses of illegal file sharing or unauthorized file sharing. Uh, the smallest e-books, 0.2% right? uh, of books are being shared online uh, without authorization. Uh, and so we could talk about the, the impact this has, and I, I assume we will to some extent uh, throughout this talk. Uh, but the main thing is going to be uh, the question of why does the internet piracy matter, right? And so of course, if you are a record producer or a movie producer, you're seeing uh, customers uh, accessing your works for free, it matters to you in the sense that you're going to lose something off your bottom line, potentially, uh, in terms of a lost sale, a lost opportunity to develop a customer. Uh, but there, and so Mark and I probably won't disagree on many things about basic copyright. And one of them, for example, uh, is for, when you have someone go into a movie theater with a camcorder and start to actually video or record uh, the motion picture that's being shown, to then turn around on the street corner and sell copies of it, 
that's unauthorized, that's illegal, and that should be punished. My, my favorite example was recently watching the movie Avatar a couple of years ago, where someone went into the 3D version of Avatar with a standard camcorder uh, to try to record that. Right? Obviously, that's not going to be a very expensive or valuable copy of, of Avatar. Uh, of course, we, he, he was immediately ratted on, uh, or in, and the owners of the theater were informed that he was escorted out of the theater uh, by the police. Now, uh, the other thing that Mark and I would probably agree on is that individuals selling unauthorized copies so that they could profit from them themselves is something that copyright should probably prohibit and address. And it may be the kind of thing that a life plus 70 isn't such a bad framework for, even if we could f find a shorter period of protection. Uh, because basically, we agree that artists deserve to be compensated for their work, uh, and they deserve to be rewarded when the public finds uh, their work valuable. Uh, the main problem is going to be how far this should go. Right? And but even before the internet, uh, the question of how far copyright protection should extend was one of serious debate. And in, boils down to the simple fact that copyright owners, and I suggest owners, not necessarily artists, and we'll get to that in a second, have been pushing for the beginning of time the idea that copyright should protect the full value of your work. Right? So that the law should give you perfect protection. So anytime someone enjoys your work or benefits from your work, you should be compensated for that. Uh, uh, then uh, just a professor uh, Souter uh, is argued in the 1970s in his tenure piece before he was Justice Souter, uh, I'm sorry, Justice Brown, that this was ridiculous. No, no one ever gets the full value for what they do. And I'll return to this in a moment. Uh, and the other thing that we have to do is discuss what are the costs of this. As we kind of extend copyright protection, both in terms of the length and scope of, uh, of protection it affords, what it will it do to things like the internet, to the technologies that make sharing possible, but also make new forms of creation possible. All right, so I wanted to say I wanted to keep this lively, and I want to give you an idea that uh, I found troubling a long time ago. So in the very first panel talking about Napster, I had the privilege of being on the panel with Ralph Oman, who was a former register for copyrights, and uh, it, it, for the Copyright Office. And he said, in a rather remarkable moment of candor, he said, what's the big deal? Uh, and here we were in this middle of this global debate about the appropriateness of Napster uh, and, and why copyright or how copyright should apply to the very first peer-to-peer -peer system uh, that became publicly available. And he was saying, what's the big deal? Not in the sense of why are we debating about this at all, but why are we even questioning whether or not copyright law should shut Napster down? Absolutely, <coughs> right? It should shut Napster down. And his reason was, or what he said was, this is just entertainment. Essentially, what's lost to society if we shut down Napster uh, in order to uh, protect Avatar or to protect uh, the latest Adele song or Justin Bieber, Bieber tune? Right? What's really lost if a college student or a professor uh, or a business person isn't able to make a copy of a motion picture they didn't feel like going to see in a movie theater? listen to a song they didn't want to download from iTunes uh, if they were forced to. What's really lost uh, to society? Uh, I wanted to take that to a slightly different approach here, and that is, uh, since we're talking about the Constitution, the Constitution doesn't speak about copyright in general. It doesn't even speak as broadly as Professor Absek suggested about copyright as a means of producing or protecting culture, uh, promoting culture. It pr it's supposed to be there to promote the progress of science. Now, what do we mean by science? When the founders were writing the Constitution, they were thinking about knowledge. Right? They were thinking about human understanding. Right? The very essence of what makes us think and move forward and advance our society. And maybe Justin Bieber does that to, to some extent. Uh, but maybe he doesn't. And I'd like to point out that this is especially problematic. Right? For those of you who had copyright law, or they're involved in the copyright industry. There's a problem here, because when we come to the question of protecting science, to protecting knowledge, copyright protection is, in fact, quite thin. What do I mean by that? I can be a historian that writes a brilliant book about the Hindenburg and who might have been involved in the sabotage of the Hindenburg. Hollywood can come in and take my theory verbatim uh, and create a motion picture out of it without my authorization. If I am a historian and wants to show a movie in its entirety about the Hindenburg in my <laughs> class, I may very well get sued for copyright infringement. 
So there is a disconnect between, I think, what the founders intended or what we thought of uh, for copyright and what's happening right now. So I ran out of time. I'll stop now and look forward to the rest of this discussion. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear questions from our student panelists, beginning with Mitchell Diles. Uh, these questions are addressed to both speakers, and each of you will have three minutes to respond to each question, beginning with uh, Mr. Absent, followed by Professor Koo. CISPA, as proposed, allows for corporations to share information with the government to protect against potential economic cyber attacks. If enacted, private companies such as Facebook, Microsoft, Oracle, and Symantec could provide users' information to the government without notifying the user. Do laws such as CISPA violate the right to privacy? Well, we, we all know we've when we speak about the Constitution and privacy, that uh, they're just in terms of reproductive rights, uh, you get into a real discussion uh, because there is no express prohibition on privacy in the Constitution, but there are all sorts of penumbras. And um, I happen to agree that that it would violate someone's privacy for that to happen, and I'm I'm really not in favor of that law. Um, again, I I feel it's. Uh, an effort to legislate something that just, you know, doesn't doesn't really doesn't really work as you, as you try and legislate it, and, and it's a real problem, private piracy, and we're trying to deal with it. And one of the problems I think is that um, to go back a little bit to what Professor Ku said, I, I'm not, I, I mean, I agree with him that that um, scientific works have a, have a thinner layer of protection than expressive works. It's just the way it is. I mean, under the fair use doctrine, um, there's even a, a factor that, that talks about a creative work versus a factual work. And the reason is because, well, Professor Ku was speaking about that case with the Hindenburg, is because research and ideas and facts are not protected by copyright, only the expression of those facts. So when I counsel some of my clients in my practice, they think, you know, that they're going to file a copyright application for some theory they have and it's going to somehow give them what amounts to patent protection without the rig rigorous exam that patent protection would provide. And I have to explain to them, no, it's just going to protect, you know, basically the order of the words on your paper. Someone else can, you know, take your theory if it's not protected by patent or trade secret law, express it in a different way, <coughs> and, you know, your, your underlying theory is not, is not protected. But, you know, from the, from the printing press, which was really the impetus for the first uh, so-called copyright act, Statue of Man, uh, when it was realized, here we have technology driving the need for the law to do something about it. And here we had, for the first time, you know, monks weren't copying books one at a time. There was no real danger of piracy. There's the first probably concern about piracy, I think. And suddenly we have this printing press where it would enable somebody to reach a market with a lot of books. And uh, it was realized that then the first to market would be able to uh, capitalize on this. And so we needed some sort of intellectual property law. The 20th century for music has seen this. Um, suddenly we're you know, we're all up in arms about the selling of plastic, you know, whether it be acetates or uh, cassettes or, or albums or CDs. But, you know, the 20th century was the first time that the music industry was that. Before the 20th century, the music industry was other things. And the music industry will be other things. So it's more than just selling those pieces uh, of plastic. I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, to address that question, is, is it an invasion of privacy? Uh, I mean, it, it, as a matter of law, the answer is no. Uh, read any terms of service agreement that you have. Uh, with one, of the, one of the limits that is always in every one of those policies is a legitimate request for information. Uh, by the government. Uh, a stronger worded policy would be uh, as required by law or court order. Uh, but uh, right after 9 11, I had the uh, fortune of kind of organizing a conference on, on privacy 
uh, and unfortunately, could, uh, obviously at the time it was organized before 9-11, but it occurred afterwards. One of the panelists who worked for AT&T and was general counsel for AT&T made a very, very important point that is still living with us today, and that is that the greatest change with respect to privacy after an event like 9-11 was not that the government would, in fact, take on additional powers uh, that it may or may not have been authorized to do, which unfortunately did happen. Uh, but actually, the greater collaboration between the government and industry in involving the sharing of information. And that prophecy has been absolutely right. And so essentially, for the most part, especially on the internet, many companies have been used to the practice of providing information to the government anytime the government requests this information. This has been especially true when copyright and other intellectual property protection has been at stake. Uh, the handful of companies that have pushed back, most notably Verizon, uh, did so because they, they grew up under a very different regime. Right? If you're a Microsoft, you're a Google, you're, you're growing up in a world where the government is not always a problem. Like, the government could very well be your friend, right? It's actually a customer. Uh, and for Google or other internet companies, the government helped you get started. Right? The technology and much of the research was created uh, and helped to fund by the government funding. Right? But if you were a telephone company like Verizon, you were used to the idea that there was a separation between your business and the government right? in terms of your users' expectations of privacy and what they thought could be shared with the government and under what circumstances that information could be shared. Uh, so when Verizon was asked by copyright owners to turn over massive amounts of information, for example, about uh, who, uh, what subscribers were posting uh, information in peer-to-peer -peer networks or in forums, Verizon actually pushed back, and it was the first one to really do so. And it led to courts saying that, yes, we need greater specificity in turning this over. However, the idea that a private company can generally share information with the government if the government requests it, unless you have in your policy agreement with that company an understanding that that information will not be shared, it has traditionally not been protected by the Constitution. Thank you. Given the rapid developments and increased use of technology to send and receive information, how do changes in these media affect the way we interpret the Constitution? Well, I'll just focus on the, on the um, Copyright Act, which is derived from the Constitution because uh, Congress was empowered to, act, uh, to, to let, uh, come up with, with an act that comported with the with with Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. But what we have now is 17 U.S.C., Section 106, which has a bundle of rights. And so copyright protection is sort of parsed out into the right of public performance, the right to distribute, the right to copy, the right to make derivative works. Uh, recently, we, uh, since the mid-90s, we now have a right of public performance in a uh, digital sound recording, but we don't have a right of public performance in an analog sound recording. And so, um, as technologies evolved, um, I think there's a strain. I'm going to go back to my printing press um, uh, story because now we have a Copyright Act that was devised, even though it's not that old. It, it took effect January 1, 1978. That was devised for a time that didn't that didn't foresee the internet and what was going on with copyright works. And all those little rights I parsed out um, to talk about maybe a more expansive view of piracy, one that I don't share, but I think one that is difficult and brings the fair use statute to bear on this. And it's difficult to bring the fair use statute to bear because, by the way, you don't know if you have fair use until a federal district court says you have fair use or more likely an appellate court says you have fair use. So, it's really imposed a lot of burdens, for example, on documentary filmmakers. I, I know many, many stories where I think there have been legitimate fair uses of copyrighted material. And these poor documentary filmmakers have to change their film and the integrity of their film just because they have to get errors in admission uh, insurance. They're going to go on PBS. They said, did you license everything? No, I didn't license this. Why not? Well, because it's used in a historical content for about Contacts for about 10 seconds. We have a little bit of The Simpsons here. No, no good, you know. So then you have to be willing to be litigated against, which is very expensive. So this copyright statute with this bundle of rights, I don't know that it works so well with the internet right now. Uh, it makes it very cumbersome and it makes pirates out of a lot of children who are just having some fun 
not necessarily distributing copyrighted works for profit, not necessarily depriving the proprietors of those works of money, but uh, children and people who have, again, found their voice with the internet and who are participating in culture, which I support, and now they're becoming pirates because they take a bit of a copyrighted work and they're going to do something very clever with it. And you have to go through this analysis under fair use to see whether it's a fair use, and even then you don't know. Uh, so that's a very broad question. I'm going to try to, to narrow it a bit for our purposes here. And like, like Mark, I'll try to keep a copyright component as the, the focus here. Uh, one thing is the court, Supreme Court's been very uh, conscious as it's been interpreting the Constitution. Uh, to recognize that there are dramatic changes in technology and circumstances in society, that there are no way our 18th century framers ever could have envisioned. Uh, and as a result, they've been very good, in my estimation, at saying that the First Amendment, in particular when we're talking about free speech, or the right of privacy, uh, as it's been recognized in the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, and other constitutional protections, have to, have to be adaptable and have to change. Uh, with circumstances, right? Now, obviously, any of you who are familiar with the Constitution and the debates of the Constitution, that very premise is itself incredibly controversial, right? That the Constitution should adapt and change at all uh, for some is inherently problematic. Uh, but, and, but what we're seeing it right now in the copyright context is, in many respects, an abdication on the part of the court or an unwillingness on the part of the court to get into any substantive debate about the limits of the copyright law. Right, so originally in the Eldred versus Ashcroft case, when the court was asked, they said, wait a minute, life plus 50 seemed to be fine for everybody uh, in the human universe, uh, and now you're attacking on an additional 20 years, which for in many cases is essentially 120 years of protection. Uh, which means that most of us will not be able to make use of anyone's work that's created today in our lifetime, right? Even many of our children may not be able to make, make use of that. How could this be part of the limited times provision in the Constitution? Uh, more recently, the court looked at the idea of, oh, well, we're going to give copyright back to works that had lapsed. They lost copyright protection. Right? And so the idea that you could perpetually extend copyright by just tacking on another 20 years here and there, and then retroactively applying it to works that uh, were still protected by older statutes, the Supreme Court said, we're not getting involved in that. Right? This is an economic policy question. Congress has made a decision here, we, whether we agree with it or not. Uh, if the majority of the court said it's not something that the Supreme Court should touch. Uh, same thing in Golan when they said, we'll retroactively take works that were in the public domain, protect them again, even though that really seems to be at odds with the idea that you have limited protection for copyright. The Supreme Court wasn't going to get involved again. And so many of these issues that we'll talk about, you know, to what extent the SOPA, PIPA, or any of the new pieces of legislation, are they consistent with the Constitution, isn't really going to ever get litigated uh, in any meaningful respect. And so it's essentially a policy question. And so as you pay attention to these things, as you read about them, uh, they're not, in the end, copyright law questions or constitutional law questions. Uh, they're going to be a policy question of whether or not we think it's better for society to have this kind of protection. Uh, or if there are costs that are too significant to allow that to occur. Thank you. Professor Abstein, your publications indicate that copyright law must adapt to changes in the way people receive information. First, if you could both please comment on what are some of the changes necessary to avoid the evisceration of copyright law. And second, if copyright law as we know it should cease to exist, how could the rule of law then protect intellectual property? Well, um, I suppose if copyright law didn't exist, there, there may still be some unfair competition claims one could bring. Um, um, you know, without, if there were no copyright law, there'd be no preemption uh, under Section 301. So there's a variety of state law claims that, that may apply. Um, but, so your question, your first part of your question, could you please repeat that for me, just so I understand it? Sure. Uh, what are there some of the changes necessary to avoid the evisceration of copyright law? Well, um, all right, I'm thinking on my feet here, and I guess my, my answer is, is really, and, and if I had the answer, boy, it would, it would be, uh, 
I'd be very sought after. Uh, because everybody's trying to figure out the answer. But I think, I think it's a combination of what kind of, I agree with Professor Koo, what kind of world do we want to live in? And how do we make the Copyright Act adapt to the world we now live in? And some of it may just be you know, new models. Again, this may be an area where technology leads the way. And um, policy leads the way. And new business models lead the way. And then copyright sort of has to follow. I'm not going to advocate here today that we need a stronger copyright act to prevent um, piracy. I think, ironically, we probably, I'm not going to say a weaker copyright act, but we need something that is inflected in a very different way. We need a whole new paradigm of thinking about this rather than the separate bundles of rights. You know, I've heard a lot of interesting models about, here, here's one example, thinking outside the box. You know, right now we have a lot of people who are perhaps pirates because of what they're doing on the internet. And LimeWire and, you know, one model is, you know, we all pay for water, right, in our house. We, we get a water bill. And I sort of like this sort of analogy. So LimeWire and all the garden variety file sharing networks, they're like the tap water, okay? And what you do, we have the technology right now to meter what's going on into the house, and it's got certain privacy considerations as well, but you have certain technology like deep pack inspection where we can look into the pipe and see what someone is doing. And you could get a little, um, email or a phone call and say, we see what you're doing. Would you like to now pay for this? And so if you just got garden variety tap water, lime wire, whatever file share, maybe pay a small amount every month. But if you want Perrier and Avion and Aquafina, you know, if you want iTunes and you want services that are more elegant and more convenient, then you're going to pay more for premium services. But the whole point is, everybody pays something. And you get this big pot of money and then you compensate all stakeholders. I don't know if that actually answers the question, but it's, it's trying to think outside the box to try and make Copyright Act and technology sort of work together for the future. Thank you, Mark. I don't know if you meant to do that, but that endorsed an idea I proposed years ago in an article on Napster and the creative disruption of copyright which was essentially, uh, if we look at what's happening with changes in technology, what the internet did more than anything else was, as <coughs> Mark Apps I discussed earlier, is eliminate middlemen. The distributors are essentially unnecessary in many respects to make a work go from an artist to the public. Right? There might be other means of showing it, right? which is why we have large motion picture studios that are showing it in 3D now, why we have concert halls and venues that give you a completely different experience than the experience you can enjoy on your laptop or on your iPad. Right? But uh, the idea is, in the world without a middleman, what could we do to create works, right? or encourage artists to create works? Right? So in a world without copyright law, as a result of changes in technology, would we still have creative works? And the answer, of course, is yes, we will. Right? And I want to give you a slightly different take on this, right? Because the, my proposal was if we cared about giving them extra money because I'm downloading this song now, which, by the way, I have not downloaded an unauthorized song, not just purely out of self-serving motives, uh, it, it, since the very first days of the internet, but because I'm in a different demographic than many of the students do. Right? <laughs> uh, students have no money, uh, access to unlimited technology, and lots of free time, right? And so you are the perfect <laughs> pirate. Right? Uh, I have limited time, uh, more resources, and I just don't want the headaches of downloading a virus onto the computer. Right? So I'll pay 99 cents at iTunes. And then also iTunes and the idea that new business models can be created to change uh, the landscape. Right? But we could live in a world without copyright protection. And I said, look at education at the beginning. Look at education. Very few faculty members, very few, make a living off of copyrights. Right? Yet, what is our most important function in society, right, at least from my perspective and from the copyright clause's perspective, educating the next generation of individuals. And this is all done without copyright protection, right? Those of you who have my copyright case, uh, my internet law case book, no, I don't even update it on a regular <coughs> basis, so you can actually buy used copies uh, instead of paying whatever the current uh, retail price is for a textbook like that. 
Uh, so how bad would it be if the world of musical performers uh, and motion picture performers went back to a world in which they could capture not the full value of their work, right, but a significant value of their work in the motion picture studio, in the theater, in, at the concert hall. Right? And right now, today, that's billions of dollars still in the marketplace. Right? I, I don't think there are many, as Mark said earlier, right? there are not many authors sitting in their basement or sitting in their garage thinking, well, you know, I'm only going to get $12 billion, uh, from my lifetime as a performing artist. Right? No one's going to say, well, I can't be as rich as J.K. Rowling, uh, so I'm not going to write my novel. Right? They're going to write. Uh, because there's still, even if they're not doing it for other motives, they're doing it for financial motives, there's still a lot of money uh, to be had at the end of the day. And there's still lots of models to allow them to capture them. Thank you. Can the United States pass effective internet legislation which is internationally applicable? I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I would like to respond to Professor Koo. I bet he'll give you a good answer to that question. <laughs> Make up for me. I, I really don't know. I don't know if it's possible. I mean, we could speculate. But um, uh, I, I, when I record, I thought there were immense problems with SOPA and PIPA. Um, you know, it's one thing to, to get intermediaries uh, to cooperate with uh, copyright creative industries. It's another thing to try and legislate that, and then you, you just start unpacking the legislation and you see just all the problems. Um, I would just like to say, I think, you know, just so we have a clearer picture here, and I, I think you'll probably agree with this. I mean, we're not talking artists. I mean, we're not talking about millions. I, I gotta defend the artists here, okay? Because it's we're not talking about millions and millions of dollars to artists, okay? It's true that the record companies may have deserved what they got. Okay, because in the early 80s, they were just, I can imagine this meeting when the first CD, which was unprotected, right, uh, came into contact with the computer, and um, they thought, initially, they were laughing it up, we're going to get to sell everybody what they already own all over again. And that's exactly what everybody did. Everybody went out and bought everything they owned on vinyl on CD. Until they realize this perfect storm of CD and computer and the internet, unprotected C, uh, CDs meant that they were in a lot of, a, a lot of trouble. Um, but when you get to the artist, the artist always gets screwed by the record companies, all right? <laughs> screwed, major. Okay, I mean, I, I don't have time to go, you know, take my class if you're, if you're one or two. Um, so when we're talking about artists and writers, it's true without copyright law that artists and writers may write for fame, for notoriety, for women, for, for lots of reasons, and for, for money. But most artists and writers don't make, you know, they're not millionaires, and they're just trying to eke out a living, okay? And I am in favor, it's not why we're supposed to have copyright laws, you know, there's no natural right theory and all that stuff it's supposed to incent. But as policy, and what kind of world do we want to live in? I think that's a legitimate question. I think we want to live in a world where if you want to be a songwriter, and you're a decent songwriter, and people are buying your songs, you ought to, you ought to be able to make a living, a middle class living. So. If I could follow up on that, and then I'll get to the can we control the internet question. Uh, the, I, that's where Professor Absek and I agree. I mean, what I'm trying to do today is point out that there is a disconnect. Right? Uh, a, a reward, being rewarded and compensated uh, for what you do as a creative artist, uh, in many respects, it gets, allows you to be disproportionately rewarded uh, compared to uh, being a historian or an English professor, a math professor. Right? Uh, the only people who really benefit in universities are medical and engineering researchers who right? can patent something. Occasionally, you'll get a professor who'll go off the reservation and write a piece of fiction, right, and, and sell millions of copies of books that way, right? But that's usually not part of their job description, right? And I'm not sure how Dean Ed would feel if I decided to write the latest thriller about, you know, about law schools, right? But that's certainly farther afield from uh, the copyright clause and the Constitution in which I'm supposed to be writing about, right? 
Uh, so we do a lot of these things. And the question is, when we start with copyright and the idea that, yeah, you protected the word, right? So the idea expression dichotomy is what helps us, uh, in some respects, differentiate my work uh, as a piece of copyright policy or as a story uh, from the works of a fiction writer. Uh, we have to recognize that that was how all copyright started, right? Even a poet was limited to their express words originally, right? A novelist uh, would be limited to the actual expression, right? So I get a bridge a work and cut it into smaller pieces under the original Copyright Act and be entitled to do that, even though I didn't add anything of my own other than my editing choices. Uh, and yet we've expanded that kind of protection for creative works, right? Maybe rightly so, but without doing that for the works that actually promote science uh, and, and other aspects of human understanding. To, to, can we control the internet completely? No. Right? Can the United States do it uh, on its own? No. Right, there are too many parts of the internet that are outside of our jurisdiction and beyond our control. But can we influence major portions of the internet and the major players involved with the internet? Absolutely. Right, and that's why if you look at these pieces of legislation, they're no longer going after purely website operators, right? because those are the worst people. They can be anywhere. They can put a server in one country that they're not even connected to, and then good luck trying to find them afterwards. Right? So who are we going after? We're going after the major telecommunications companies. right? We know where they're located, and they're doing business in the United States. We're going after the credit card companies that, if they want to make money off of the internet, right, they have to be an intermediary for that. Right? So the US and US policy clearly have a significant influence on the future development of the internet if we allow the government to assert control uh, through these very important points where we can have a lot of leverage. Right? Uh, notice, we weren't so happy and aren't so happy when China, for example, does that in terms of content regulation uh, with regards to service providers or Yahoo or Google. Uh, but copyright seems to be good. Compared to private user agreements, does the Constitution play a less significant role in the debate of internet regulation? Compared to private, you mean like terms and conditions on websites and yes. stuff like that? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, um, as Pro Professor Ku rightly pointed out, there really is no, I mean, this is a matter of contract, and when you, when you go on any website, you, you consent to have, you know, we don't have a federal privacy law in the United States right now. We may one day. Um, the rest of the world protects, takes privacy a little more seriously. Uh, although, if you have terms and conditions on your website, uh, you better, in a privacy <coughs> policy, you better adhere to it. Um, and, but all the time, I mean, myself included, um, you know, we, we read things where we agree to, particularly on the internet, with one click, and uh, don't pay that much attention. You're trying to buy something, and you're just going, yeah, yeah I agree, I agree. You have no idea what you just agreed to. And, and um, you know, they, you may have agreed to have you know your your email address sent out to some companies. You'll be marketed to all of a sudden. They're going to send you updates from now on. But I don't think there's anything in the Constitution right now um, that would supersede what you expressly agreed to in the contract. If that's the question. Uh, to follow up on uh, well, Professor Absack, I mean, part of this is. Uh, for quite some time, the Supreme Court through the Fourth Amendment has recognized something called the third party doctrine, which is essentially when you provide information to a third party, you have no expectation of privacy. Right? You shared it. Now, that seems a little odd because sometimes we're going to be sharing information with individuals and with entities uh, that we think we're only sharing for limited purposes. And so if I give my information to my bank, I think I'm only sharing it with my bank, not some advertising or marketing firm that the bank wants to then turn around and sell that information. To. Uh, but that hasn't been uh, the Supreme Court's take on that uh, since essentially Smith versus Maryland. Right? So the idea is by turning it over to somebody else, you've essentially disclosed that. And so in the old view of thinking about privacy is really privacy is information secrecy and confidentiality. Uh, we, <coughs> the Supreme Court's not recognized any privacy protection there. And so the, there are many of us in the privacy world that are really 
pushing back on that view of privacy, especially as you can imagine in a world in which so much information is shared regularly and almost automatically uh, in many instances. And yet there's clearly, if you look at the public's perception, uh, an expectation of some forms of privacy. Uh, for example, do you really believe that everything you post on Facebook uh, should be used to make a decision about whether or not you get a job, uh, whether you get admitted to case, uh, or whether uh, you should get health insurance? Uh, these are the kinds of questions that we're starting to really push back on and at least start to have uh, debated about in the public arena. Thank you. Um, now we will take questions from our audience with priority given to students. We ask that you please keep your questions brief and respectful. Um, we will have two people walking around with a microphone. And once again, the speakers will have three minutes to respond to each question. Um, you guys have talked a lot about CISPA and PIPA and whether or not it's constitutional. What do you think about the Open Act in response to those, and whether that would be more constitutional or less constitutional? I don't know that I'm familiar with that. Fresh, could you want to heal it? I'm not familiar with that new piece of legislation. Either. I'm relieved. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're trying to answer it. Can you, can you give us the broad outlines of it? I haven't actually read it in like over a year, but it was um, a proposal set forth by um, different uh, lawyers, like, IP lawyers and internet workers, and it was, um, I think it was called a wiki law, where it was digital, where anybody could add on to it, and it was um, people's response to SOFA and SISPA. Add on to what? Copyrighted works? It was promoted by Wikipedia and I think Google. I want and it was about um, copyright law and privacy. Um, basically, it, it didn't like SISPA, and it wanted a better privacy law that was less invasive. Yeah, the, the answer is we could, I mean, first of all, neither Mark or I have said that so far people or any of these laws are unconstitutional. Uh, we, we actually think, I think both of us are in agreement, that in many instances or many aspects of them are bad policy. Uh, and, and that's really the question. I mean, really, thankfully with SOPA, I mean, you saw pushback from industry, right? I, I mean, my favorite was watching Google and like, Wired and all these online providers censor their pages in response as, as an effort to say, look, if this law passes, this is essentially what's going to happen uh, to us, right? And, and many of those providers will say very seriously that they care about internet copyright protection as well. They're not in the kind of extremist camp of everything should be free and shared, right? They're not members of the Pirate Party in Sweden, for example. Right? But uh, what they're saying is they would like the onus to be on copyright owners to actually take serious steps and invest in enforcing their copyright uh, their copyrights, rather than, for example, uh, with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. One of the things all they had to do was send you a letter. To say, look, uh, there's material on your server uh, that is infringing of my copyright, removed. And as a result of the DMCA, uh, the provider would have to automatically remove it or risk copyright infringement themselves. Right? And so all these new laws are trying to take that process, which is pretty streamlined in, in and of itself, and make it even easier for copyright owners to enforce it. And some of it is to actually have them start to proactively monitor what's occurring on their systems. Which, as you can imagine, if you're Google or you're YouTube, right? And by the way, YouTube is very carefully, and Google are very carefully created to comply with copyright law as it is written. Uh, you don't want to look at all the videos that users are posting online. You don't want to have to continue to add computer algorithms to try to figure out whether or not content being posted is infringing or not, right? See what happened after the Democratic Convention, right? Uh, the Democratic Convention itself was flagged as being infringing of copyrights uh, as a result of their algorithms. It was just wrong, right? And so as a content provider or as a web provider, you want to comply with your legal obligations, but you want them to be clear and simple. Right? And so part of the original understanding of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was, yeah, if you want to enforce your copyrights, you have to take affirmative steps to do it. And the businesses would be happy to comply with those affirmative steps, right? Many businesses would have been happier, for example, show me a court order, right? Uh, show me a complaint 
If you file the complaint, we'll respond to that. Uh, what they don't want are open-ended obligations to have to make decisions themselves as to whether something's infringing or copyright. The worst case uh, that, that I use for my students involved the songwriter and performer Prince. Uh, and a mother had posted a YouTube video of her little child running around the kitchen. Uh, and, and Let's Go Crazy is playing in the background. They sent a cease and desist letter to YouTube for the posting of that video. Right? And no one would have thought that was copyright. Can I, can I just respond to that? And, and, and um, that's right, we're not really answering audience questions now. So, I mean, I think the DMCA was beneficial in that, like you said, it gave clarity to businesses and, and sort of took the vicarious infringement doctrine and and really promoted commerce, you know, by, and I think that was the intent of commerce, was to promote commerce, uh, commerce on the internet so that, you know, you never knew if you had a website if somebody was uploading some copyright infringing content. And uh, yes, the story about Prince and that um, baby, I mean, but there again, you know, well-intentioned legislation, perhaps, but, you know, then you quit thinking about the counterbalancing fair use doctrine. And so, you know, with the, the example Professor Koo is, is illustrating, I mean, we may have a very good fair use argument there. I, I, I have seen the video, I don't know how long it was used, I didn't do the analysis, but we may, you know, for what it is, have a, have a pretty good fair use argument. So. We'll take another question. Thank you both for being here. Um, before the internet, if you wanted a product, you had to own a physical copy of it. Uh, and no one was taking that away from you without doing so forcefully. Uh, with these internet providers like iTunes and the video game port Steam, you buy a license to a digital copy, as far as I understand. Uh, and you're limited with what you can do with that copy. My question is, by the traditional definition of ownership, do you own a pirated copy of something more so than a digital copy? That sounds like a really clever question. I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. <laughs> the last thing you said, why would you have a more legitimate right to own a pirated copy rather than because you don't have a license, so you think somehow you have something physical? A pirated copy isn't going to get taken away from you. If something that you own on iTunes or Steam, I mean, I'm not saying it's likely, but if one of those companies goes under, mm -hmm. you that stuff is taken away from you, you lose all of that. If you own a pirated copy of something, you can do whatever you want with it. You actually own a physical copy of it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, with licensing, then you have all sorts of, um, you know, you have you have certain parameters around that license. So you, you're right. You, you don't really own it. I don't think you can even. I, I think recently I should know more about this. That you're not even allowed to bequeath your iTunes library uh, to your heirs. You know, and like Professor Ku, I'm not. I'm not saying he's not clever enough, but I'm not clever enough. Or I'm too too afraid to. I've never downloaded anything illegally. So I actually invest quite a bit of money into iTunes in my life. And um, so that's a bit problematic. I don't know that you have, I, I couldn't say that it should have a more legitimate right to own a pirated copy. Uh, I don't think you'd have, if it's truly a pirated copy of some other sound recording, that, you know, you just got offline where I don't, I don't think you have any, I don't think you have any right to it at all. Yeah, you actually, the argument is that you actually have less, less uh, protection for that infringement. And the reason that any of you who are gamers in the room, and there are probably a bunch, uh, may, may remember that a couple of years ago, Microsoft uh, did something quite remarkable, which was essentially turn <coughs> thousands and thousands of Xbox 360s into worthless pieces of plastic. And how did they do that? It's not whether you own an infringing copy or an unauthorized copy that matters. It's whether you're connected or disconnected. Right. If you are plugged into the internet, and this is, I mean, Mark was saying that, you know, the, the, the industry people were kind of drooling over the idea of all this new technology. They were truly 
uh, drooling over what was possible with made, by, made possible by the internet and digital technology. Why? Again, you showed your question kind of highlights one point. You don't ever have to sell anything permanently to anyone ever again. Right. Everything can have an expiration date, which means that you have to pay uh, to renew uh, or to re-up whatever you have. Uh, a colleague of mine wrote a great book uh, that talked about the celestial jukebox, right? Forget about owning music anymore. Uh, our musical experience would be essentially having to listen to a jukebox, which means paying per use every single time you want to listen to music. Uh, and obviously, there's going to be pushback from that, right? Customers don't necessarily like that. Uh, see the subscription model to Napster and how successful that was. So, uh, but the real question, if you have that unauthorized copy and you're connected to the internet, uh, read your Microsoft Terms of Service agreement and they can come in and they can render your Xbox into a brick. Uh, Apple can do the same thing to your iPhone, right, uh, to, to some extent, uh, as if you change and manipulate the copyright control <coughs> material on your iPhone. Right, so uh, owning an unauthorized copy isn't better, it's not more like uh, but in some respects, making it more like what we think of as physical property, burning it onto a disk, for example, unconnected to the internet, is, is in fact safe. Take another question. Yeah. Um, thank you both for being here. Uh, my question is actually, first of all, are either of you familiar with iTunes Match? Okay. So, somewhat. Okay, so iTunes Match is a program in which you pay an annual fee of $25 and they will match any of your songs to songs within the iTunes store. Uh, there's an argument, argument that it actually legitimizes illegal downloading because it does, in fact, match illegally downloaded songs to songs within iTunes and actually can upgrade them so that they are better sound quality. I was just wondering what your take on that was and if it could be eventually turn into a model which would help help artists instead of iTunes making the profit off of it, giving the money to the artists. I mean, to me that just opens the discussion to just a, just a whole area of these locker cases, you know, and again, where we have, where the Copyright Act is parsed up in these bundles of rights, and, you know, the locker cases are, are similar, you know, Following what Professor Ku said, where maybe your own library is now available, right, uh, in, in the celestial jukebox, in the cloud. So uh, if you're in a hotel uh, tomorrow night somewhere, you can still access your library. And the question is then a similar question is, um, do you have to populate that? jukebox with actual copies of your music? Is it okay to make one master copy of Stairway to Heaven, you know, that everybody can use? Doesn't, doesn't that make a lot more sense? But we're, we're talking about all these questions now, and there's, and there's cases uh, about that. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if there's a way to, um, to me, you know, that, that is, to me, I don't, I don't view that as a, as a really problematic to artists, you know, I don't, I, um, you know, for convenience and um, I don't, I don't, I don't view that like you have to sell the consumer the same product all over again. I don't think that's, that's really useful. But again, Copyright Act is, you know, if you read it strictly, Unless there's some sort of fair use argument, if you're making a copy of something, then you violated the Copyright Act. And that, hence, I think is a challenge with the Copyright Act right now, what's going on with technology. Now, I mean, to the extent that I'm pretty sure Apple's contracts with artists will include this. They'll get compensated for that. And that is the benefit to these, right? Um, before iTunes came out, people were wondering, right, could you monetize downloads? But, uh, is there a business model that would work to reward artists, uh, to record, or to reward recording studios and the other people involved in the industry, and make allow consumers to buy these things? Right? Obviously, uh, one interesting thing that happened, and I haven't looked at the numbers lately, uh, but it, what was very interesting to me, and I think Mark would be upset about this just as much as I was, is as, as great as iTunes was, as actually okay, creating a market for digital downloads. 
artists, the actual singer, songwriter, musician that was involved with creating the music, got pretty much the same amount of money for the digital download that they did is if they sold a single in a piece of vinyl uh, to you, right? Many of you don't even know what vinyl is. But right, if they sold the 45 to you as a record. Uh, and, and so this, the world changed, and, and people got cut out of the business model, right? But the artist essentially stayed in the exact same place. Uh, and at the time, it was seven cents uh, per download. So of the 99 cents that's getting paid, the artist got seven. Uh, and guess who got the lion's share of that, right? Apple. Uh, and so now, if it's good, if Apple can help artists get that seven cents more where before they wouldn't get anything, uh, yeah, that's probably a good thing. Right? And if it makes it convenient for you as a consumer, uh, then it's a win-win for everybody. Okay, we have time for one more question. Pertaining to music specifically, more consumers now are able to, as you mentioned, listen to more artists for free. So do you see the future of the music industry as artists specifically focusing on making their music or making their money from live performances and companies like Live Nation now becoming the new record companies? Well, you know, what you're referring to now are, are these all rights deals that were very popular. I think they sort of cooled. They've been done with you know, superstar artists like Jay Z, Madonna, and um, for, you know, this goes back to what I said earlier, which is that the, the 20th century was the first century where the music industry was really pretty much defined by selling, you know, pieces of something with recorded media on it to the consumer. The 19th century, the music industry was basically a piano, and you know, it was a furniture business, and people. Um, and she and she and, 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 and hung around the piano and. And, and the consumer had the voice there in the 19th century, right? And so in the 20th century, though, the consumer became very a passive consumer of this recorded media. What's happening now, I mean, just because technology and the law, I mean, mostly technology is driving it, it ha piracy has, the, the music industry is changed. No question. You know, the 80s, it was a time, here's the way it was. In the 80s, record companies would actually call managers. And here was the model. January, every record company was flush with cash. And they would sign 20, 30 bands at $500,000 a piece, meaning the bands didn't get that money, trust me. Again, take my class. But um, they'd hire a producer, they'd, the money would be used for recording. They, among those 20, 30 albums, maybe, a half were pretty good, maybe 10 or 15. And of those, maybe two or three sold five million copies. Your Boston's, your Thrillers, your Hotel California's, and they paid for everything. It was a venture capital model. That's what it was. <coughs> and now, it's very different. And if you are an independent music, I mean, when I came up, not that I was a superstar or anything, but I made my living in the music industry for a number of years and supported a family, too. Um, it was at least a path. The path was this. You get on the radio, and if you're in drive time and WMS plays your record, then everybody would come to see you at your show, and then maybe you sign with a label and they screw you so you don't get much money, and that's what happens. But um, you still get your writer's royalties, maybe get your public performance monies for being on the radio if you're a songwriter. And together, you hope you get to the promised land, which is you start selling out big arenas, and then you start making some money finally, okay? Now, recorded music is just giving away. I mean, that's the mindset of new bands. We're just going to give it away. And then you come, so it's a very different model already. Right? Because radio's lost its power. Radio is pretty impotent right now, you know, I think. I mean, it's become so homogenous and incestuous where you have the same stations playing the same amount. So um, it, it's just a very different industry already. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Professor Mark. Uh, Professor Atzak and most of this case. And, you know, one, one thing I wrote about years ago when I was writing about this industry was the fact that for many performing artists and performing artists, they were already giving away the music. 
right? It's essentially a loss leader. It's advertising. It's a free product. Try it. If you like it, you might develop a loyalty. You might buy a t-shirt when you come to my concert. Maybe I'll get some money off the concert ticket sales. Most likely not. Uh, and, and what you saw, actually, quite interestingly, after the kind of explosion of file sharing on the internet and record companies realizing what the, the business model shifting around them was the consolidation of the live performing market. So Live Nation, as kind of the entity that controls major performance arenas, didn't exist until the digital revolution changed the music distribution business. And so they, they said that, okay, here is a major source of revenue that we can still capture. Uh, how can we get involved in this and essentially uh, become a major contributor outside the artist, right? And maybe take a little more share from the artist as a result of doing that. But I mean, keep in mind too, what we're also seeing is a pushing down of the business model, right? There are now smaller and smaller production companies, smaller companies that are promoting artists, right? And the truth is we still have the sales model out there, right? So if you're lucky enough, to, to have you created your own work uh, or had a small producer do it, and yet it becomes a hit right, as a result of file sharing or people should talking about it on the internet. I mean, you can still sell millions of copies. Right? And so song sales have continued to increase uh, over time, even despite the bad economy. Right now, how it's being sold is shifting. It's now 2011 was the first year we saw more digital sales uh, than physical sales. Uh, and that's going to be a change in what the revenue is and what the distribution of those revenues will be. Uh, but you can still sell music and you can still sell tickets. I think the question is just how much more could you have captured in some other world or how much less would you have captured with less potential? We will now conclude with our closing statements from each speaker. Mr. Abseth will have five minutes and so will Professor Koo. Okay, well, I guess I'll just use my time to just comment uh, to what Professor Ku just said. I mean, I, I think the data shows that generally, I mean, now you're going to sell a lot less of product, generally, than you used to before uh, piracy. I mean, you know, we used, gold albums were, 500,000 units were a matter of course. R rarely happens now. You will, it's, it's interesting. You will have these isolated incidents. Adele is one where she sold a ton of records, even in this economy, even with file sharing. And, and, and I've never really read why, and I can't remember how many she sold, but I mean, it's significant. It's like the old days. And there could be a lot of explanations for that, you know, um, because number one, it was really good. And, um, you know, people, people, it crossed a lot of demographics, including older folks like myself, and so, you know, it, it succeeded. Uh, and then you have the fluke stuff that happens on the internet, like Call Me Maybe, right, which is like <laughs> everywhere, it's ubiquitous, right? And somehow that cuts through and goes viral. Um, you know, I, I think the creative content industries, uh, you know, we were always afraid of new technology. I mean, not that, um, Broadcasting baseball games is a new technology, but they were afraid of that. They thought nobody would ever go to the game again. If you start broadcasting radio, uh, baseball games on radio, of course that didn't happen. People still went to the games. Uh, Jack Valenti, who was president of the Motion Picture Association of America, when the beta um, Max came out, the first video cassette recorder, said this is akin to the Boston Strangler. It's going to kill the music, movie industry. Nobody's ever going to go see movies again. And of course, that's completely wrong. What happened is, in the music, in the movie industry, it actually works. People go to the theater and they watch Avatar, and then they buy it all over again. It's created just a whole new industry. So hopefully, the same thing happens with the music industry. We're still in the middle of trying to figure it out, and I'm not sure where it's going to um, land up. I think it is turning into a service business. Okay, it used to be more of a, I don't know how to say this in a less crude way, more of like a Sunset Strip one-off business, you know, where you're only interested in selling something to that particular person walking down the street, and you're done with them, right? They've got the product. But now, you can't do that. Now it's about service. Now it's about, I think it's more of a service industry now, and whether it lands up as subscription or, or you know, uh, through an iTunes model, 
uh, how copyright law is going to have to evolve to deal with it, the place of fair use in all this. Um, so we have a robust internet. Um, so we have um, still um, creative people who are able to make some sort of living off their um, creative efforts. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it will evolve. And the, the music industry is still very robust. It's better than ever. Uh, people love music. And people enjoy music all the time. And I haven't seen, personally, I haven't seen any young people uh, who are saying, I don't want to be a musician now because of what's going on on the internet. You know, it just doesn't happen. Because if you want to be a musician, if you are a musician, you have this impulse to be a musician. And you're going to be a musician. And I think really it is what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want musicians to have some some way, or, or songwriters, composers, some way of making a living? And how are we going to protect their creative works in a way that makes sense, that still takes into account that we have creative consumers out there who ought to be able to do maybe creative things, um, like I don't know if you've ever seen the White Album mashup that that uh, Danger Mouse did, which is, which is really creative and, and cool, but infringes all kinds of copyrights, OK? <laughs> and, and then, you know, an interesting fellow, and I'll close with this, is uh, uh, Greg Gillis, who actually went to Case. And I've spoken to him on the phone. Uh, he's actually sampled a couple of my works in his mashups, for those of you that know him. You know, whether, and he's friends with Lawrence Lessig, and you know, you know, if he's ever sued, it's interesting, he's never gotten sued, I guess. I have no interest in suing him, and, and, but some plaintiff's lawyer may be bored and think that they can sue him, and he may get sued one day, and then, the, then it's going to be an interesting fair use case. And I have thought a lot about that from a fair use perspective, I don't have time to go into it. But, um, you know, he's, then again, Girl Talk, this is Greg Gillis, he's out there, right, and he's, I mean, just the counterbalance. I'm not saying what he's doing is wrong or anything. It's, so he's doing mashups of all these works. And now he's to the point he's playing Bonnaroo, he's playing big venues. He's, he's earning big performance fees, big performance fees. And his whole shtick is built off the backs of other copyright owners. Not to say he's not creative in what he's doing, OK? But it's just uh, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, one way that Girl Talk Greg survives is he doesn't sell them. No, he doesn't. He doesn't make a recording of his mashups. Uh, he does performances and live performances only. Well, he'll give them away. Yes, and, and people can make copies and he'll give them away, but he doesn't sell. Uh, and to, well, one of the things that Mark said that really sparked it, <coughs> something in the need. And I listened to this uh, recording from Jody Mitchell uh, playing in Circle here uh, for years and years, and part of my kids like it. And uh, she starts out the introduction to this song. Uh, by, by talking about the difference between being a performing artist and an other kind of artist, like a painter, for example. And, and, and she, it's, it's a little self-serving and a little whiny, right? And she says essentially, well, you know, that's really, the major difference is, you know, if someone looks at Van Gogh, no one says, paint a story night again, man, right? But a performing artist, right, she has to play circle game again and again and again. And again. And as Mark said, it becomes a service. Uh, industry, right? Rather than kind of the ability to create a single copy, then retire, right? And then sit on the beach and collect royalties. Right? Uh, it becomes more work, right? And it's tough to, in, in our world, to say what's more deserved, right? Or, or what uh, what's a better way to reward artists, especially when you realize that artists like Joni Mitchell are rare, right? And the vast majority of artists uh, never make any money from their performances because they can't break. Or they can't get the audience, or they can't even reach the audience, even if there is an audience for them. Uh, but I'd like to end instead with a slightly different girl talk related. And there's a wonderful documentary made about uh, Mr. Gillis uh, as a case grad, not just a case grad, uh, about what he does and how it kind of fits into copyright law and fair use. Uh, in that documentary, they interview Bruce Lane, uh, who was one of the key policy thinkers uh, in the Clinton administration and one of the key authors of the Clinton administration's copyright white paper, which essentially became the theoretical foundation for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and then essentially a lot of what the basis for what followed up since about copyright law and how it should respond to digital technologies. 
And, and he looked back and he said, because he said the theory behind it was, what we is this country going to do going forward right, against the rest of the world? And his view was, well, we have intellectual property, right? That's what we're good at. We're good at making movies. We're good at writing and performing songs and writing books. Uh, we'll leave the manufacturing to the Chinese, right? So we'll outsource uh, manufacturing jobs to China. And that industry will go there. Uh, they can do it cheaper. Uh, and you know, we'll, what will we do in return? We will enforce our intellectual property against them, right? So we will buy their goods that they make, right? And they will have to buy our intellectual property. Right? Obviously, that didn't work out so well, right, as the balance goes. And, and in another very kind of telling moment, he, he says to the interviewer, right, maybe we should have been thinking about environmental regulations and fair labor conditions instead. Right? So as we kind of think about these issues about copyright law and piracy and the Constitution, my concern is that kind of too vigorous a press and too uniform a call for copyright protection, no matter how noble for artists, and especially the starving artists, it can distract us from other underlying fundamental issues uh, in this debate. Like, what is our role? What is the role of law in shaping the uh, And who gets award rewarded? And who gets punished in this process? What are the costs? Right? If the cost is to change the internet as we know it, uh, for me personally, that's too high a cost. Right? Because right, right now, what do I see, despite what's happening in the Middle East right now, I see one of the greatest tools for freedom of expression ever created by humankind. I see not just one of the greatest tools for freedom of expression, but one of the greatest tools for education possible uh, for all of humanity. Right? And if it means trading that, so, uh, so you know, a couple more artists, a couple more authors, and myself included, get a little more money in royalties, I'm not sure that's worth it in the end, or if that's a really good bargain. Right? If it means trading fair labor conditions and environmental regulations uh, for the hope that we might hit the jackpot uh, with a you know, killer song or a killer app, uh, then I don't think it's worth it in the process. Thank you to both speakers.